I am very grateful to Peggy Newman for giving me this opportunity to visit New England after a long time. I went to school in Cambridge long ago and also in Boston. I used to cross the River Charles, attend classes in the business school and also classes in the John F. Kennedy School of Government, which was then called Litauer Center. So those were good old days. New England represented a new approach. It was a very interesting place. Conservative, English, and yet open to new ideas. A lot of people came at that time and they experimented with new ideas. Two of the professors who were teaching at that time were expelled from the university the same year that I was here. I was not responsible for that. Professor Richard Elpert and Professor Timothy Leary, who conducted experiments in what they thought were possibilities of expansion of the mind through physical inputs, like Mexican mushrooms, like the chemical extract taken from those mushrooms called mescaline, like the chemical extract taken from similar hallucinogens and mind-expanding drugs like lysergic acid, dimethylamine, popularly known as LSD in those days, like DMT, a derivative of the same drug. I remember going to a small group in which there were members of the Boston Yoga Society, sitting together and discussing the amazing effects that little things like plants can have upon evolved species like human beings. It looks so strange that human beings, with all their awareness, all their evolution, all their knowledge, all their civilization, would still depend upon plants to give them more awareness. It looks so funny that people actually believe that the plants they ate were leading to greater dimensions. But whatever the merits or demerits of those experimenters, the fact they set in motion a certain inquiry after truth, an inquiry into the limitations of the mind, was a keynote of the environment of New England at that time. And now I come back and share these thoughts with you. I am reminded of those times at Harvard University. Needless to add that one of the professors, after expulsion from the university, became a Baba, went to India, and got some real exposure to what knowledge can be acquired from human beings with a higher level of evolved consciousness. He found that plants were not the only thing that could set off the trend towards greater awareness that human beings existed upon this planet who could perform a much more satisfying job. The other professor, Timothy Leary, he went and he was accosted by the organized religious groups, so he set up his own church called the Church of the Boo-Hoo, which was to indicate to the people how the ridiculous and the sublime are all mixed up in our organizations. They served a certain purpose. They served to indicate to us that we can be blinded by the very process of consciousness that can lead us into enlightenment. They serve to point out that human beings do not live by bread alone, nor do they live by thoughts alone, nor do they live by mind alone. There is something beyond mind which is available in a human being, and that something which is beyond mind is far more valuable than anything we have gathered so far in the process of civilizing ourselves up to the point where we stand today through mental development. It was a big challenge 
to people who were responsible for civilizing other people. It was a very big challenge to the educational process. In those days, if you went to any educational institution, you would see the signs put up here. Think. Any one of you remember that? They put up the signs on the walls. Think. They said that is what people are not doing. That is why we are doomed to what state we have reached. We don't think enough. So they would advocate. Think. Think. Those words fortunately have been removed now. Because people have found that the more they thought, the more confused they got. The more they thought, the less they knew. The more they thought, the more doubtful they became. The more they thought, the less confident they were. The more they thought, the less religious they were. The more they thought, the less spiritual they were. The more they thought, the less self-aware they were. They lost something. The more they thought, the better the divorce rate went up. The more they thought, the more the children ran away from home. The more they thought, they began to destroy the very civilization they had just killed. What good was that? Why should thinking do this? What happens when we think? When we think, we are using only a small part of our conscious process. A process that is responsible for very few things in our conscious life. Thinking is merely use of words and images in order to derive a logical conclusion. There is no other purpose of thinking. When we say, let me think about it, what does it mean? Let me use words and sentences in my head so that I can come to a conclusion which should look logical. If it is logical, it's fine. If you think hard and want to come to all your conclusions of life, what do you miss? You miss that powerful information system sitting in the head called intuition. That gut knowledge, that sudden flash of knowing that comes. Has any one of you ever felt that intuitive power, that sudden flash? You just feel, this is it. How many of you have felt that? Will you show me your hands? Great. So you know what I am talking about. It comes to you from nowhere. That intuition, that gut knowledge, that sudden flash of knowing something without thinking. In fact, sometimes it is against what you are thinking. Where does it come from? Not from the mind. The mind cannot generate it. I will tell you presently why the mind is incapable of generating an intuitive information or knowledge. But worse than that happens. If you think hard, you refuse to listen to intuition. If you don't think and the intuition tells you something, you are likely to act upon it. You are likely to accept it. You are likely to go right. During my several years of counseling people, I have heard this statement over and over again. I wish I had listened to my first gut knowledge. I wish I had listened to my intuitive feeling about this. But when we don't listen to it, we miss an opportunity. And what is it that makes us so unresponsive to intuition, so negligent to intuition? It's our thinking process. We think too much. The more we think, the less we listen to it. And then, intuition is not the only thing we lose by thinking so hard. We lose that most wonderful of all things, which people have tried to describe in the best possible words. And they could not find any words. The word that is called love. If there is one thing that is destroyed by thinking, love. Have you had that experience? That you have love for somebody and then start thinking about it? What happens to that love? Goes. Have you ever had a communication with people with pure love, no thought involved, and then start thinking about what that relationship is? What happens to the relationship? It breaks up. Thinking has caused more damage to loving relationships than any other single cause. And yet we all 
feel that mind and thinking is so great, the intellect is so great, we should rely upon the power of the intellect. There is a third casualty which takes place if we rely too much upon thinking. And that is the experience of beauty, aesthetics. What is beautiful? Have you ever defined what is beautiful? You open a window one morning and say, what a beautiful day. But there is a period of time. How can a day be beautiful? But when you look out of the window and say, what a beautiful day. You are not describing a day. You are describing the experience of that moment. What you are feeling. If you feel happy and joyful and open the window, you will see a beautiful day. No matter what is outside. If you are mad at somebody and grumpy and feeling irritated and angry and you open the window, nothing is beautiful. So, what is beautiful is created from the same source of consciousness which creates love, which creates intuition. And this love, beauty, joy, happiness, intuition is not dependent upon the mind. In fact, the more you use your mind, the less you experience these things. This is so obvious to those who experience these things that they wonder why people are denying to themselves the experience of love, joy, happiness, beauty by thinking so hard about it. People read books, they think, they put everything into an intellectual apparatus and they want to have love, joy and happiness. They never find it. They find great pessimism, sorrow, the absolute despondency of everything. Nothing is going right. Everything is going wrong with themselves and with the whole world. If you want to know the despair of humanity, go to the thinkers. They will tell you. If you want to see the beauty of the future and the lovely possibilities that are coming up, go to the people of intuition, the people of the spirit. Have you heard a word called soul? S-O-U-L, soul. How many of you heard this word? Soul. I suppose everybody. Do you know what soul is? In 1962, when I first came to this country, an advertisement appeared in the newspapers. And that said, a man in California has offered to give quarter million dollars to a person who can prove that human beings have a soul. He was so skeptical. He thought soul is a concept. The people think there must be a soul because we must be divine, because there must be a God of which we are participants, because God must invest something in us which makes us have a soul, but nobody has experienced a soul. And he challenged. He challenged the whole world. Come on. Here is the bottom line. I share quarter million dollars in US funds to a person who can come up and prove to me the existence of a soul. I don't want to hear lectures about it. I don't want to hear philosophies about it. I don't want to hear any gospels about it. I want a person to demonstrate that a human being sitting like this, like us, talking to us, having thoughts like us, having a mind like us, has also a thing called a soul. And that view was so widespread that when I was introduced to various audiences at that time in this country, they sometimes said, he is going to speak to us about the higher possibilities of a human being, like finding one's own soul or mind or whatever you call it. People introducing me used to mix up as if soul, mind, makes no difference. And yet, all the difference lay in that distinction because thoughts, sense perceptions, Interpretation of sense perceptions, reasoning, logic, these are all functions of the intellect and the mind. Whereas love, intuition, beauty, joy come from the soul. They have different origins. You cannot combine the two. Nobody has experienced love with the mind. Nobody has said, I thought very hard and therefore I could love somebody. Never happened. On the other hand, People who experienced love for somebody and felt so high with the love alone and they thought and thought about it, they destroyed that experience of love. Nobody has got love through mind. Nobody has got the experience of beauty through mind. 
Nobody has got the experience of intuitive knowledge through mind. Mind has given them reasoning, thinking, logic. What is logic? If you look at it closely, it is a very close circuit way of looking at things. Logic, as described by the logicians, can be employed in the process of intellectual reasoning, either in the deductive way or in the inductive way. When you employ logic in a deductive way, you are merely stating in the inference, in the conclusion, what has already been stated in the given statement in the beginning. What the premise indicates is also part of the conclusion in deductive logic. For example, I often give this example, this wall is painted pink, that portion is part of that wall, therefore it is pink. This is logical. What have you learned from this statement? Nothing much. You have learned what you already knew. Most of our logical conclusions only lead us to repeat in different words what we already know. Therefore, they do not add to our knowledge. The other kind of inductive logic is very dangerous. In that, certain words have to be used like perhaps, probably, maybe. According to the law of probability, we have to use such words. If this wall is pink and there is a corner around it, the painter must have used the same color. So probably, I inductively come to the conclusion that portion is also pink. This kind of inductive logic, which functions on the law of probability, on the law of a possible continuation of an experience we are having, suffers from the great defect of creating doubt as it gives us the information. Inductive logic never gives us any inference or conclusion without adding doubt to it. Now, what happens to a person who thinks very hard? A person who thinks a lot either learns more words to say the same thing or he begins to say words with which he must add these words, maybe, perhaps, possibly. That was my experience, even in these, in my alma mater here, the Harvard University. The more learned a professor who would come to give us a discourse or a lecture, the more he would use these words, maybe, perhaps, possibly. This is also one of the point of view. This is also possible. We may take this also into consideration. Why was there so much lack of confidence? If people like me came from the East and made a statement which was clear, meaningful, full of knowledge, they would say, he must be dogmatic. He's brought all this dogma from the East. We must question him first. And the more they questioned, the more doubts they had of the person who was being questioned. Why was it? They failed to recognize at first glance that their doubts were being created by the very process they were using to understand and to get knowledge. When the process is based upon the use of the mind, doubt is an integral part of the process. Therefore, the more you think to resolve a problem, the more doubts you get. If we were ending with doubts, it wouldn't be so bad. But doubts lead to another negative thing. The more doubts you have, the more fear leads. So doubt and fear becomes the hallmark of a civilization based upon thinking and intellect. You go and look at the people. Go and look at different cultures around the world and see where you think the intellectual civilizing has come up. Intellectual civilizations have come up. They are the ones who have the maximum doubts and the maximum fear. I meet people who are afraid of something all the time. Sometimes they don't even know what they are afraid of, but they are still afraid. In fact, most people do not know what they are afraid of. If they knew what they were afraid of, they would not be afraid. You will notice when you find fear in a person arising by overuse of the mind, the fear is arising from not knowing what they are afraid of. The root cause of all fear is ignorance, not knowing. And fear is always of the unknown. If you do not know what the other person may do, you are afraid. 
If you know what the other person is going to do, even if the person is going to do something negative, you will not be afraid. The emotion of fear will be replaced by another emotion to stop the person, to take preventive measures, do something else. We have in the East conducted experiments on fear because it was assumed, perhaps logically, if I use the Western expression, it was assumed that if you are spiritually evolved, if you are at a higher level of consciousness, you must be fearless. If you are still afraid, you must be more primitive. As society has grown and consciousness has evolved, we have tried to overcome fear. In the stone age, they were afraid of shadows. Socrates found no difficulty in finding an example of human fear when he talked of the three men in the cave. In the stone cave, the three men were looking at their own shadows. The light was falling from outside. As they saw the shadows, they felt they were monsters and they were afraid. Those three shadows which they thought were monsters were created by themselves. Because had they not stood in the way of the light, there would be no shadows. They stood in front of the light which was coming from outside the cave and therefore they cast their shadows inside on the wall in the cave. And they huddled together and cringed together, afraid that these three monsters are going to attack them. And Plato records this incident. And he says, these men are afraid of their own shadows, which they themselves have created. What is the basis of that fear? The basis of that fear is ignorance of what those shadows are. Therefore, a man came from behind. A man in the light. <clears throat> an enlightened person who came from behind in the light. He pointed out to them, My friends, why are you feeling so frightened and huddling together, afraid of your own shadows? These shadows are being cast upon the world because you are standing between the light and the wall. And as you move, so the shadows move. They are not out to attack you. You are moving together, therefore the shadows appear to move. If you don't mind, turn around. Look at the light behind you and have the knowledge that it is the light behind you which is casting these shadows of your own bodies and you will know we are mere shadows, we have nothing to be afraid of. When that man advised them, what did these three men in the cave do? They got together and they said, whispered to each other, don't listen to this fellow behind us. He is he's a conspirator with these monsters. He is the devil himself who has come from behind. He wants us to turn around so that the monsters may attack us. So they never looked behind and never got the knowledge that they should have got. Socrates and Plato used to say, this is the plight of the human being. And today, more than 20 centuries later, we can still recognize this is the plight of the human being even today. What are we afraid of? Have you ever given thought to this? Look at what we have been afraid of in the past five years. Bring them before you and you will see they were shadows cast upon life, upon experience, by yourself, by your own mind. The mind created these shadows and you got frightened of things which were not real. So much havoc the mind can play upon us, that we can get caught in this intellectualism, in this logic, in trying to know everything through the mind, everything through the logical process, and then we know really nothing except fear and doubt and limited information, which is not knowledge. The difference between information and knowledge is, knowledge makes you light and happy, makes you rise above ignorance. Makes you come from darkness into light. Information adds on more burden upon your memory. Adds on more burden to remember what facts were real and not real. And creates a greater discordance between the earlier information you packed into yourself. Thereby creating so-called contradictions. People who try to understand spirituality 
who try to understand theosophy and theology and religion through the intellect are caught in this trap. They cannot solve the problem of contradiction which they find between one statement and another. They cannot solve the problem of contradictions in the various truths that they get through the system. It is obvious that this is built into the system of operating the mind. That as you use the mind, you will get more and more into other interpretations, possible interpretations, different interpretations, therefore lack of knowledge, of real knowledge of the truth. Where do we go from here? This is a subtle point, very strange point. What else do we have? We understand the limitation of the mind. It is easy to understand all I have said. It explains that the mind is very powerful. But what else do we have? Am I not using the mind while talking to you? Are my words not sentences of the same nature as the thought streams in our head? Is this verbal communication not really mental communication? Is there any way we can overcome this and find a communication that is not mental? In what name shall we give it? And how can we reach it? That is the million dollar question before advanced civilizations today. How can we overcome the problem of using something which we have no knowledge of? Using something within ourselves to which we have no access except through the mind. Mind is a stumbling block. Mind comes in our way and we have no other way except to approach the limitation of the mind with the mind. How do we do it? It's a real question. People try to overcome the problem of the mind by instituting a dialogue in their heads. And they call it the negative and the positive. And they say, most of our problems are because of negative thoughts, because of negativity. Therefore, overcome it. How? By setting up a parallel positive thought. And therefore, they extol the virtues of positive thinking. Bring positive thoughts to overcome the negative thoughts and become more confident, become more positive in life. For a moment, it looks to like it would work. But it is like beating the mind with the mind. What really happens to a person who practices positive thinking for a long time is an intense fatigue of the entire intellectual system. Have you met people who practice positive thinking? You see their state. Not in the first six months when they can dwell greatly on the advantages of reading the latest book on positive thinking. But after six years, when they tried it out and they find they are tired, they are bored, they really don't know. It may be fine, but didn't work the way they said it would. What happens? What is tired? It's the mind that gets tired. And why shouldn't the mind get tired when you set up the mind to fight the mind? Positive thinking is nothing more than setting up the mind to beat the mind. It's your own mind, not somebody else's. You are not putting somebody else as an adversary to use your mental powers to overcome somebody else. Positive thinking means as the negative thoughts come, you beat them. Ultimately, it becomes what is called a battle of wits. Now, what does the negative mind depend upon? In this battle which we set up artificially through the process of positive thinking, we set up the negative mind pulling in one direction and the positive mind hitting on the head. No. What does the negative mind want to do? It has a very simple way. It wants to enjoy. It likes pleasure. It seeks pleasure. Whatever gives it pleasure, you go for that. You don't put any pressure on the negative mind at all or on the mind as situated and say, mind, what do you want? Go ahead. And you will run after pleasures. And what constitutes pleasure? The desires to the sense perceptions. We open our eyes and see things. Wow, that's great. I like to see that. Open our ears. That's beautiful news. We start tasting good food, touching no end to this perception. All these sense perceptions lead us 
into a world of desires and fulfillment of desires and the mind wants to fulfill all that. And what does the positive mind say? No, it's wrong. Stop. Don't do it. I'll hit you hard on the head. You set up this fight and this fight can go on for the whole life. I know personally people who are fighting this battle in their heads all their lives. What have they got out of it? We are really tired of life itself. It doesn't make any sense anymore. What have they got out of it? They have not found that this whole institutionalized game which we have set up is mental. It does not take us beyond the mind. Let me get back to the soul, the spirit. The spirit which is the core of consciousness. Consciousness is the ability to be aware. We wake up in the morning, we are aware of everything. We are aware of ourselves, we are aware of our bodies, we are aware of our senses, we are aware of our thoughts, we are aware of ourselves beyond thoughts, beyond body, beyond senses. This awareness is called the spirit or the soul. The mind cannot function unless you put awareness into it. The senses cannot function unless you put awareness into it. The body cannot function unless you put awareness into it. Awareness is the very substance that life is made. Awareness is the very substance which gives rise to any kind of experience whatsoever, whether mental or non-mental. This awareness is called soul or the spirit. And if something can be experienced purely out of that awareness, not tied down to, not barricaded by, not enclosed by mind, senses or body, that is called spiritual. What is spiritual? Arising from the spirit per se, not from the attachments to the spirit. The mind, the senses and the body are attachments to the spirit. But if we can experience something which is not dependent upon these attachments, that experience is called spiritual. Therefore, love, intuition, beauty, joy, happiness have been described as the experiences which are spiritual. You study any tradition, any literature, any scriptures, anywhere in the world, you will find these qualities of experience are associated with spiritual experiences. But the other experiences of negativity, fighting down your own desires, spreading out thinly your mind through thoughts and attachments in this world, having to overcome attachments and greed and avarice and things that lead you to the world are considered mental. These are the tricks of the mind being played upon the human individual who is created by awareness, soul or spirit. Therefore, there is something which can be called beyond mind and it is within each one of us and that is the reality of awareness, reality of consciousness which we may call the soul or spirit. A discovery of that reality within oneself without the attachments of mind, senses and body is called self-realization, is called spiritual self-realization, is called taking the first step to knowing who you are. If we really are the soul and these are attachments put on ourselves, then finding out what soul means in experiential terms would be called self-realization or knowing oneself. We know ourselves when we know our spiritual self. If we do not know our spiritual self, we do not know ourselves. We only know the covers upon the spirit. How can we know ourselves? Ever tried it? It's not very difficult. Why do we feel we are the physical body? Because we identify ourselves in the physical body. Supposing one fine morning we got up and said, This physical body is nice. But it is a house. After all, awareness and consciousness is using the body, is living in the body. We can feel it, we can think about it, we can contemplate it, we can actually experience it. We close our eyes and take our attention to the whole body and we find that attention can move and experience the interior of a house which we are using and calling physical body. 
what would happen if the physical body were not there? Would we still be there? If we were, then we would find out the physical body is not ourselves. Then we would find out who we really are. Therefore, if there is a mechanical way, a mechanism, a method of experience one's conscious aware self without at the same time having to experience the physical body, if we can do that, we would at least take one step towards knowing who we really are. The Eastern mystics and masters have been giving this simple message. Also Mideast masters, including Jesus Christ, they gave a simple message that the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of our creator, our own true kingdom is within us. That is a simple message. What does it mean? That this body is not really our real experience. If we could experience something <coughs> that is within us, that would be our real kingdom. They not only left it in doubt whether they were talking of within as an as a allegoric form of description or they meant with the body. Then all the masters all the mystics, <clears throat> including those in whose names big religions today stand, including Jesus Christ, they said, if thy eye be single, thy whole body shall be filled with life. They referred specifically to the body. That the possibility of having light and knowledge exists while we still have this physical body. All we have to know is, how can we experience something within the body? How can we experience something that is not this body? Therefore, they said, don't cut the body into pieces and see what is inside. You won't find anything because awareness will disappear. Try to hold your attention on awareness and make the attention on the body so low, so negligible, that you become unaware of the body. If one could become unaware of this body and yet aware of oneself, one would know what one is. So they taught very simple system. They taught a simple method by which we could withdraw our attention from the body onto something that is our self, our consciousness, but not the body, and thereby finding out who we are. It was a very simple experiment. They did it personally. They made others do it. They say today also, such masters have, have existed at all times. Look at the history of mankind. Every time they came, we said, this is the only one, the real one. When they went away, we set up a religion in the name of that person. He said, he was the only one. He didn't say this was the only one. He said, he was the only one, as if God is so unfair to the rest of humanity. Into the rest of posterity, we will never give that opportunity again. This is quite contrary to any concept of the generosity of God. The truth is, <clears throat> such masters came all the time, still come, will continue to come. Because they come for our sake. They come to enable us to find ourselves. Because when we find ourselves, we find that within ourselves, for ourselves, is the real kingdom <clears throat> of our own real nature, which is the soul, spiritual nature. And that is the residence of God. So God realization is just one step next to self-realization. They were not purists. You must have noticed none of these masters were ever philosophers or professors. They never taught in universities. They came like simple people like us. And they talk to us from their personal experiences. And ran a lot of things after their name, but forgot that they came only with simple truth based upon their personal experience. And they spoke from that personal experience. And they spoke with a conviction. Nobody else spoke like that. Some people who often read the Bible here, in this civilization, they are struck by the fact that in the Sermon on the Mount, after Jesus finished speaking, what does the Bible describe the scene after he finished speaking? There was a hush from the multitude. 
for he spake like one with authority and not like the scribes that's the main distinction even today you go and see the masters who have personal experience they speak with the authority of their experience not the authority of books not the authority of literature not the authority of somebody else's experience but their own experience that is why their whole emphasis is on the experiential nature of their teaching they do not say believe in this and in you will go next life in heaven believe in this and after death something will happen they don't say that they say the truth is with it you and can be found here and now experience it they give an opportunity and a possibility to us to experience what they are saying right now therefore their method is simple method is attention which is again a function of human mind can be used to pull yourself inwards within yourself from those things which are distracting you pulling you outside the senses the desires the body it creates relationships outside sit in meditation sit in contemplation sit within yourself pull the attention to your own self within it will gradually withdraw your attention from these distractions outside ultimately it will withdraw your attention even from the extremities of this body ultimately you will not even know if you have a body but you will know very well who you are you will find you are more alert more awake more free more aware ever before that's all they say withdraw your attention personally where do you withdraw no special point they are saying withdraw your attention to your own self to your own aware self to your own soul wherever is the source of consciousness coming from inside you when you open your eyes you can see you are conscious wherever it is coming from close your eyes and withdraw put your attention back on where you are wherever you feel you are wherever you experience you are coming from go back to that you will find your awareness increases does not become less if you become totally unaware of this physical body you will realize that you have a form which is far more luminous far more light it has no limitations of this gross body and you can call it by any name you can call it astral body etheric body fine body refined body doesn't matter but you will find that you are really trapped in a physical body and you always thought this was great you don't have to be trapped in it but did anybody tell you and did anybody advise you that you can have this experience of your own body the real form trapped inside this they don't stop there they say even the so called astral or etheric body what does it mean what is it consisting of it doesn't have the flesh doesn't have matter doesn't have these molecules it has something else other elements what are those elements that make the astral body those are the elements of the five senses when you use your senses to see touch taste smell when you use different senses which you think are fit into this body you find that the senses go and travel with you even when you <clears throat> withdraw your attention from this body therefore the astral body is nothing more nor less than the ability to have sense perception when we think we are having the sensory experience of this world because of the physical body we are mistaken you would draw your attention become unconscious of this body the sense perceptions are still there in fact they are more alive more vigorous more active than now but these mystics these experimenters in self realization these masters they don't stop there they say why don't you withdraw your attention from the senses and therefore from the sense body to the core of consciousness your soul what will happen you can be absolutely unconscious and unaware of the senses and still be more conscious of yourself what will happen then you find that your mind from which attention began to start from which attention began to create the whole experience of this world that that mental self of consciousness 
can subsist independently of these coarse layers of the physical body and the sense perceptions. Anybody can experience it. They didn't say specially qualified people can only do it, or only people in that particular country can do it, or people having a particular color of the skin can do it, or that you have to have this education to do it, or that you have to be so high or so tall or so short to do it. Everybody can do it. A child of five years can do it, an old man of 100 years can do it, anybody can do it. Withdraw your attention, close your eyes, put your attention on where you are operating from. When you are oblivious of what the body is, what the senses are, you find out your mental self in its entirety, in its fullness, in its wakeful form. And that can be called by any name, doesn't matter. It's the cause of all mental experience arising through attention. So sometimes it's called the causal body. It can be called the super refined body. It can be called the mind. It may be called the universal mind. It may be called universality. It may be called universality of consciousness. It may be called time, space, causation, continuum. These are words. They refer to the same experience. And each one can have that experience. Most of the yogis, swamis, and various spiritual teachers who have come in history and have written books and traditions for us have gone up to that level and taken us to the universality of human mind. That is why people fail to realize that there was something beyond mind. Very rarely do we come across a person whom we call a perfect living master. Very rarely do we come across such a person who can teach us beyond this level. Who can say, even the mind and the attention that flows from this is only an instrument of consciousness. It is not consciousness. The fact that we can operate in time, space, and cause and effect relationships is not the reality of things. It is the framework in which consciousness has been formed. Therefore, consciousness, therefore, soul or spirit is beyond them. But they teach the same method. The method is the same. Go within. If you go within your own mind and put your attention on being there, not gathering or going somewhere, being there. Being where? Being at the source of consciousness. If you can withdraw your attention from the source of all conscious experiences and be there in the center, from that center, which we call the spiritual center of consciousness or the soul, gives us awakening into the fact, into the experience that mind was not us, that we were using a mind, that mind was an extension of consciousness which created an experience to the beginning, the middle and an end. That all experience, all experience of awareness does not need a beginning, a middle and an end. That a beginning, a middle and end or the illusion of time is needed only for mental experience. How does this realization come? By withdrawing attention, even from the mind and the senses and putting it back on the origin of consciousness and discovering that mind can be put in oblivion, can be put aside and we can experience ourselves without the use of the mind. And what do we experience when we are without mind? Suddenly we find we are flooded with the experience of love, joy, happiness, beauty, the same things that were happening to us with all the covers intact when the mind wouldn't let us keep these experiences. Then we discover that the experience of love, joy, beauty, happiness, aesthetics has never come from the mind. It came from our own original spirit, our own self. That our self, shorn of these covers, was automatically capable of these things. Then we discover for the first time that unlike learning and thinking, we don't have to learn how to love. We don't have to learn how to appreciate beauty. We don't have to learn how to have intuition. These things are natural to us, but we were blocking them because of the overuse of the mind, senses and body. This capacity to go beyond the mind and to have personal experience has been made possible for everyone. And then not only that, it is not kept as a theory, as a possibility. It is made into a day-to-day -day practice. It has been adapted to our needs. 
we are living in a caste society. And every day we have to move fast, keep up the rat race, look at the bottom line all the time. We always look at how many dollars do you have. I find even if a spiritual teacher comes, if he comes in a Rolls Royce here, people run to hear him. And if he came in an ordinary fakir's robes, ordinary robes of a poor man, so how can he have anything? He has no money, how can he have spirituality? We are living in a strange society where the bottom line itself has become the material way to look at it. In such a society, it is not easy for us to perform these meditations, introspections of going within ourselves on our own. Nobody has done it. Nobody is doing it. Nobody is even bothering to do it. People are lecturing about it and not doing it. Such a thing. We are all outward materialist thinking the physical reality is the only reality. Therefore, the mystics and masters who have come and always made their message of truth very simple have made it equally simple for contemporary society. And they said, even in the physical world, you can still spend time in the company of these mystics. If you spend time in the company of these mystics, a strange thing happens to you. You are touched within yourself with the truth which you have been seeking. If you have been a seeker, it affects you instantly. If you have not been a seeker, it affects you slowly. But the seeker who has been looking for something suddenly finds there is the door open. There is the answer to my questions. In the physical world, in physical life, and therefore these internal experiences of intuition, beauty, love, joy, happiness get externalized. As if intuition were the language of God speaking within. And if we don't have the wisdom to look within, God comes outward and starts speaking within to us through the physical environment around us. And what is that language of God outside, which is so important for contemporary society, that is called the language of coincidence and circumstance. Ever heard this word, coincidence? People talk of it. Strange coincidence happened today. What is coincidence? Coincidence is nothing but the assembly of different events in our life outside. In the physical world, tell the message. Because they defy the law of probability. They defy the law of logic. They defy the law of reasoning. They defy the mind. Every, every coincidence defies the mind as much as every intuitive flash defies the mind. Not only that, if people are willing to listen to intuition, they will see the coincidence coming in their life at the same time or immediately following that. As if there is a tie up between the two. That our seeking of the truth within is coupled with the language of the Lord, of the Creator coming from outside and confirming what we are seeing. This is making it simple. People in contemporary society who are so materialistic can find testimony and evidence of the spirituality around them coming in the form of circumstances and coincidences. How much easier could the Creator make it for present day human seekers to find the truth and the kingdom of God with it? Therefore, these perfect living masters, these mystics, who share with us their experiential knowledge, they don't say, look, read a book and do something. Why don't they say that? Because they have read the book and they found first time they read the book, it meant something else. When they made some progress, they read the same book, wow, it means something else. They found every time they made progress, the book made some different meaning. How can they recommend the book to us? They know the book will mean whatever you can understand at that time. Therefore, they say, go within, follow what the book says, do that, then read the book. Then again do what the book says, then go and read the book. They are laying emphasis on the experiential quality, the experimental quality, the personal working quality of spiritual practice. In fact, they say so openly, if you were to read all the time schedules of all the airlines of the world and kept on reading every day from morning till evening, you will have no experience of flying in the air. If you read all the guidebooks of all the vacation lands, you may even know all the names. You may even tell people how beautiful the places are. 
you have not really had a vacation. Real vacation is if after studying the time schedules and reading the guidebooks, you undertook a vacation, you traveled, you went to the airport, got a ticket and flew. Then you would say, yeah, I had a personal experience. And you can throw away the guidebook and still talk about the vacation you had. That's the kind of vacation these experienced mystics promise us. And they don't say, take it, we tell you the way, now go. We don't know where we are going. The mind has boggled us enough. The intellect has kept us entrapped. The body doesn't let us have any feelings except body relationships. Where are we going? Therefore, they say, don't go alone. We are with you. This is the hallmark of the perfect living masses. They never let a disciple, a seeker of truth, go on his own. They say, do not go on your own unaided. Go with somebody who has already gone before. Take that person as a guide who has been there before. Therefore, they having been there before, they become the guides and the teachers of seekers who really want to go. Not want to learn about going, but want to go. So those who want to go on the path beyond the mind into real spirituality, into real experience of the origin of love, joy and happiness, they get the benefit of the personal company of these masters and these guides. The masters are in human form, like us. They can befriend us. We can talk to them like friends. They become so ordinary that we sometimes argue with them. We attack them. We even sometimes kill them and crucify them. They are so ordinary. They become like us. Why do they become ordinary like us? Because their purpose is not to show their supremacy, to show that they are superior. Their purpose is to kindle in us love, joy, beauty, happiness. The real sources of our spiritual wealth, the real nature of our soul, they want to engender these qualities in us. Love is only born between human beings, between ordinary human beings. Look at the world. Look at the history of love. Love has not been between high spiritual beings and ordinary people. Love is an experience between ordinary people. When a high spiritual being wants to give to ordinary human being the experience of love, he becomes an ordinary human being. Then only we have experienced love. Love is an experience between ordinary human beings. I have often referred to a possible situation where a real spiritually evolved person may come walking, maybe flying into this room and flies into the sky, always keeping his feet four, five feet above the ground. What will we feel for such a person? He will come and say, wow! Ah! We will be struck by awe, some by fear, some by terror, some even by worship. We will have all kinds of feelings, worship, awe, terror, admiration, not love. Can't have love for such a person. If while he is flying in, he suddenly falls, drops, everybody will run. He will run first to help him. Oh, sorry, I hope you are not hurt. He says, no, 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 just a little bruise here. And he'll fall in love with him for the first time. What is he, is he going to fall in love with? The ordinariness of the person. Not the extraordinariness of the person. Therefore, people with the light, with the knowledge, with experiential knowledge, when they come and kindle in us that experience of love, joy, happiness, beauty, they kindle to the process of love by being ordinary like us. They've always been there. And their message is so simple. Our mind wants to complicate it. The message is, go within. The truth is within yourself. They don't come to set up a religion. They don't come to set up a cult. They don't come to propagate a particular philosophy. They come with a simple message. The truth is within you. Go within. And find it. What do we do? We don't go within. We worship them. We put them on a pedestal and set up a religion or a cult or a society or a philosophy after them. This is the beauty of spirituality. The spiritual teaching gives us the truth of our own knowledge within. And this is the tragedy of religion that we have bottled up spiritual teachings into rituals, ceremonies, dogmas, traditions, philosophies and put them into scriptures and books 
and never practice that. If we can loosen ourselves from these and see what the message in the scriptures is, we can start becoming spiritual again. Spiritual experience, which is ultimately the experience of love, joy, happiness at being released from the bondage of mind, senses and body. That spiritual experience is beyond mind and can be obtained by any one of us with the help of a perfect living master whose only qualification should be he should have personally experienced what he is telling us to do. He need not have any degree from any university. He need not be well read. He need not have written any books. He need not have even read any books. His only experience is that he has gone exactly on the path on which he wants us to go. And he is willing to hold our hand at every level. When we are physical, he is holding our hand physically and giving us the support we need to understand it physically. When we are astral, he is astral with us. He doesn't desert us. When we are causal, he is causal with us. He tells us what the mind is like. When we are spiritual, he is spiritual like us. When we are a soul, he is soul like us. When we are in the ultimate truth, in the totality of soul, in the oneness of consciousness, he is that oneness of consciousness in the same form. If such a being can be found, we are lucky. We have found the way to go beyond the mind. Thank you very much. Thank you.